our, our, our medical patients being the ones we refer direct to the catheter lab and we bypass the ED. So it's just basically building on top of that process that's existed for our cardiac patients for some time now. And we just extended that to trauma. Brilliant. Well, listen, Matt, thank you ever so much for your time again. No worries about those little technical issues. We'll, we'll claw that time back. Christian, Christian will give you some lip for that, don't you worry? <laughs> Thanks, Thanks ever so much. Thanks ever so much. So I'd like to welcome Natalie. We're heading over to Canada now. So uh, paramedic of 25 years, critical care going on, uh, critical care uh, for 20 odd years, works full time as a critical care paramedic for the Provincial Air Ambulance Program and as an educator part time. Her passion lies in the development and delivery of initial education and continuing education for all levels of paramedicine. Natalie, thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Natalie. I'm a critical care paramedic in Ontario, Canada, and I'm going on 20 years as critical care and almost 25 in the system as a whole. The goal of this symposium, as I'm sure you've figured out at this point, is to talk about the ways that critical care paramedicine is delivered around the world. And as a presenter, I was asked to consider what does critical care paramedicine look like where you practice? What do you do that's unique or different or special? For many people, critical care paramedicine is a skill set. If you're part of social media community, you'd be justified in thinking that CCPs run around intubating everybody with rocuronium and ketamine, bougies in our pockets. We scoop and run with all the really serious trauma patients performing cool life-saving things like thoracotomies, blood transfusions. We have an enormous drug bag and we know how to use it. As a CCP, advanced area management for sure is part of our scope. Mechanical ventilation, advanced resuscitation techniques, management of critical illness or injury, definitely the bread and butter of being a critical care. Maybe for you, when you think about critical care paramedicine, you think about a particular call type, multi-system trauma, maybe complex extrications, field anesthesia, cardiac arrest, remote area rescue, now, the first time I administered thrombolysis was on a scene call in the outskirts of our coverage area. In Ontario, we have limited availability of advanced care paramedics in parts of the province. And so those of us as critical care paramedics provide medical support in, for scene response in addition to our usual trauma. For other people, critical care paramedicine is closely linked to a vehicle. Check out the photos of CCPs on social media I'd be willing to bet you'll find a whole lot of flight helmets and helicopters. If you don't arrive in something flashy with critical care stenciled on it, are you really providing life-saving care? A lot of critical care medicine is getting the right care to the patient in a short amount of time. In high density areas, CCPs run around in rapid response cars or swoop in in the cutest little itty bitty little helicopters. Where distance is greater, we might use things like planes, large helicopters, or grand, ground ambulances. In fact, I saw a really cool photo of a critical care ambulance based out of Vermont. Uh, that thing was almost a transport truck. In Ontario, where I work, our, our big orange helicopter that flies around saving lives is so famous, infamous, that our service is even named for it. So what's unique about critical care paramedicine in Ontario? Well, nothing that I've told you so far sets us apart from the other CCPs. If you've heard from uh, uh, Ben and Matt, we, we all do some very similar things. We all do RSI intubation. We all manage complex trauma patients. Uh, we all do mechanical ventilation. We all have a really uh, complex pharmacology uh, from which to draw. So what's different here in Ontario? Well, Canada isn't called the Great White North for nothing. We are the second largest country based on land area, but we barely make the top 40 in terms of population size. Of the 38 and a half million Canadians, 90% of us live within 250 kilometers of our southernmost border. Something I think it, that's more a reflection of our climate than our southern neighbors. With centralization of specialized medical services located primarily in densely populated areas, getting to that non-urban bushwhacking 10% of Canadians uh, can be a bit of a challenge. Getting them to the right care at the right time, that's something that's quite the logistics. 
So this is the province of Ontario, the most heavily populated province in Canada. We've got 14 and a half million people spread out over a little more than a million square kilometers. So for those of you not good at math, that's an average of about 14 people per square kilometer. That's lots of room for us to stretch our legs. But as you can see from the map, we're not even close to evenly spaced out. With most of our 14 and a half million people residing in the southern tip of the province. Even in the populous south, most communities have less than 10 people per square kilometer. And the north by comparison is so sparse that the people are vastly outnumbered by the beavers, but not the bears, thankfully I checked. To put this in a perspective, the UK has four times the population living in about a quarter of the space. So on this map here, you can see the purple general outline of the United Kingdom overlaid onto the province of Ontario. The UK has around 500 more hospitals than all of Canada combined. A few years ago, I did a ride out with one of the UK Air Ambulance programs, and uh, I found it fascinating that they could reach their entire coverage area within a 15 minute flight time. 15 minutes of flight barely gets you out of the city of Ottawa, and it only gets you about halfway across the greater Toronto area. You can imagine, even with a 139 helicopter, this is a vast amount of space with which we're trying to cover. So how does our geography affect how critical care paramedicine is practiced in Ontario? Well, these are the transport statistics for my service for Monday of last week. Unlike many critical care services worldwide, team calls make up only a very small percent of our call volume. And so as you can see from last week, we did less than five scene response, less than five modified scene response. The majority of our transports were in a facility. And I checked the weather. This was not a weather related uh, low call day. Just before COVID shut down a lot of international travel, I attended a conference in Scotland and their ambulance service gave a presentation about secondary tasking, a fairly new concept as I understand it for them. Uh, Hamish crews that couldn't make it to a scene were be beginning to arrange with rendezvous at nearest hospitals in order to expedite transport to lead trauma hospitals. That's Tuesday here for us in Ontario. With coverage areas of more than 90 minutes in diameter, even the super fast 139 helicopter has difficulty making it to a scene before land EMS departs for the closest community emerge. Critical care paramedics in Ontario, by the numbers at least, is all about that interfacility transport. We do between 1,500 and 2,300 patient related transports per month. So that means either uh, moving a patient specifically, sometimes the same patient multiple times, depending on uh, what they're going for, or an organ for donation. Around half of these are serviced by our fixed wing aircraft that are stationed primarily in the north. So they're a pretty busy vehicle. And if you're looking for a comparison, this longest patient journey trip of under just under 1200 kilometers, that's about the same as flying from London to Barcelona. CCPs in Ontario work in a dual critical care paramedic configuration. We undergo several years of training in order to provide intensive care unit levels of care to all of our patient populations. While Canada still doesn't require a degree to practice, here in Ontario, it's five years of post-secondary education to obtain your CCP certification, in addition to mandatory work experience hours. As the majority of our calls are between hospital facilities, the preponderance of our education focuses heavily on the hospital-based medicine. We are one of the few internationally recognized critical care teams that do not fly with a physician or nurse. Uh, we do have physicians as part of our program, though. We kind of have to. Uh, Merge or ICU trained physicians get additional training in the transport environment, and they support our crews with clinical decisions by a uh, telemedicine and occasionally video conferencing. COVID saw a real change in our response in urban centers. Previously, we did a lot of repatriation, kind of stable ICU transfers, um, busy, 
but not really critical or integral to the healthcare in Southern Ontario. I mean, if we didn't exist or we weren't staffed, the hospitals were able to put together an ad hoc team with relative ease, jump in the back of a local EMS and make their way to the receiving hospital without too much difficulty. At the peak of the COVID surge, we were transferring more than 50 patients a day between ICUs to try to maintain capacity in our system. And this was on top of our usual call volume. We don't have that many vehicles. Um, most of the decanting was being done by ground ambulance with support from local EMS to provide us with additional trucks and drivers. Uh, four hour transports of ventilated patients in land ambulances were not uncommon for us. Eventually things kind of settled down a bit in Ontario, right at the time that some of our uh, neighboring provinces began their surge. And uh, when they started transferring patients into Ontario, we worked closely with their provincial services and even the military to provide patient care. We even have an example where we made use of a multi-patient bus in order to maximize our transport capabilities. While tertiary care transport needs such as ECMO, balloon pumps, and prone transport are what drive our scope of practice, it's bringing ICU care to resource-limited communities that makes us a critical care of the critical part of the healthcare chain in Ontario. Take a drive outside of any big city in Ontario, and you will quickly find yourself in one of Ontario's small rural communities. Many of the eMERGE departments in these communities are staffed by single general practitioners with two or three eMERGE nurses. Overnight, the eMERGE doc is often the only physician present in the entire hospital. Early in my career, there were even a few hospitals that had overnight coverage on callback, not in-house. Interfacility transfers are a huge burden on hospital and EMS staff and resources. Transferring one critically ill or injured patient to a tertiary care facility may see a rural hospital lose their physician and nurse for more than half of a shift. It often takes the 911 ambulance away from the community for the entire day. Our standalone critical care teams help to take the pressure off of rural community hospitals and 911 services. For many of our eMERGE partners, we play a key role in the resuscitation and stabilization of critical patients bringing with us drugs and equipment that many of our small emerges don't have. In the Northwest and most recently in the Southeast, critical care paramedics have partnered with regional teaching hospitals to provide multidisciplinary simulation training for our community ED partners. Nothing like some interdisciplinary just-in-time training to build uh, teams and ensure access to exceptional care. At what point does a rural community become a remote community? I kind of set the line for remote. If you, even with an immediate helicopter or plane response, you're unable to get your patient to definitive care within a couple of hours, in my mind, that constitutes remote more than rural. While thankfully infrequent, large casualty incidents in remote communities require some truly extraordinary transport logistics to get patients to definitive care. The example that I've got here is a crash from 2018 outside of Wawa, the top arrow on the map, uh, that resulted in nine critically injured patients, including four critically injured peds. The adult lead trauma hospital was about two hours away by road. Um, but the pediatric patients had to travel to London, Ontario, more than 600 kilometers away, seen by the lower little red arrow. This is an 11 hour trip by road, so air ambulance resources from around the province were mobilized to get the kids out. Weather, crew configuration, and staffing sometimes result in a mix and match crew traveling by planes, trains, and automobiles in order to complete the transport. We even had crews travel by float plane, skidoo, ATV, boat, and canoe to reach the patients in our great Canadian wilderness. With all the pediatric tertiary care hospitals located in the south and only two adult lead trauma hospitals for the entire north, the number of remote hospitals in Ontario, by my definition at least, is quite large. For many facilities, ground travel to tertiary care can't be completed in a paramedic drive day. 
and even air travel can be more than a half day trip. Throw in snowstorms and freezing rains, very frequent occurrences here in Ontario, and occasionally patients can wait days in the community setting. Now, I've been pretty spoiled for most of my career working in the resource plentiful south of Ontario. My biggest complaint is that the Starbucks are closed on night shift and I have to resort to drinking terrible fast food coffee chain coffee. And my biggest worry is backing my ambulance into the ridiculously tiny end of the row parking space at the Kingston General Hospital. But years ago, when I was young and trying to pay down a mortgage, I did a bunch of tours through our northern bases. What an eye-opening and professional growth experience that was. We had trips to go get seriously ill patients that took so long, we had time to watch an entire feature-length film on our flight there. On a different day, I found myself in the open bed of a pickup truck in the rain, bracing the stretcher with my feet, my back against the opposite wall of the truck bed, transporting an acute coronary syndrome patient, running multiple drips from the clinic to the airport. Definitely not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Our northern bases were the first to get portable lab analyzers, mostly because our physicians were tired of us responding to their, you got any labs questions with, yep, in tubes and a paper bag coming along with the patient. Whether it's long flights across the entire province, cramming 100 pounds of gear into a cab from the airport, then trying to figure out how to get it all upstairs to the patient, or complete telecom failure when you're just about to take off with an infant that you're running for ECMO for. The critical care paramedics that service our remote, most remote communities are logistics wizards and seriously badass clinicians. The relationship between Ontario critical care paramedics and the Indigenous communities we serve is especially important. With communities of only a few hundred people, serviced primarily by small nursing stations, and in many cases, accessible only by plane year round, critical care paramedics are sometimes the first contact with acute care health resources. Spring thaw and fall freeze make ice roads and ATV tracks impassable and boating unsafe. During those months of the year, especially uh, indigenous communities rely on air ambulance services for access to healthcare services. With many of our communities not accessible by road, ambulances must be flown in. As you can see from the picture, they get loaded in the back of a large um, plane and make their way gradually uh, via non-serviced roads to a lot of the remote communities. As you can imagine, repair and maintenance on these vehicles is challenging in these resource limited communities. And so many opt for SUVs as transport vehicles instead. Organizing ventilators and drips in the back of an SUV sure takes talent. In the winter, ice roads increase the accessibility of some communities. One of our bases in Moosonee, Ontario, uh, is entertaining for staff when they first join our program because it's not accessible by provincially maintained road. It's a train or a flight to get to Moosonee. Long time ago, the hospital that was built to service that area of James Bay was initially intended as a tuberculosis hospital. And so they built it on an island. Uh, that tuberculosis hospital is now the main hospital for the entire James Bay region, and it's still on an island. Unfortunately, the airport and the hospital clinic are on the mainland. In the summer months, the island's accessible by boat, uh, but during breakup and freeze, there's limited accessibility uh, and basically reliant on helicopter only. The icebergs that pass through the channel can be so big that one once took out a local church, or so I'm told. During the height of COVID surge in Southern Ontario, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were made available to the general public. The challenge across all of Canada was getting these really fussy temperature sensitive vaccines into remote communities. In Ontario, Operation Remote Immunity was launched in February of 2021 to administer the Moderna vaccine to our flying communities. In a five month period, more than 25,000 vaccines were administered in 31 remote, primarily indigenous communities. This five month period really showed the level of dedication and professionalism of our advanced and critical care paramedics. Medics flew all over Ontario to maintain staffing uh, in our regular vehicles, 
while also upstaffing vehicles for surge response and leading two-week rotations of vaccine clinics. Vaccine clinics. There are less than 200 critical care paramedics in Ontario, and each and every one of us stepped up to the plate in some way to get our communities through the pandemic. Even after all of that, the team still had the energy to go back several times again to deliver boosters and the pediatric vaccination doses. Not only was ORI a critical project in ensuring access to care for remote communities, it allowed our paramedics to spend time in these communities engaging with leaders and strengthening the relationships with our Indigenous healthcare partners. Everyone came home with stories to tell. For Tara, her team decided to camp out overnight at one of the immunization clinics in order to continue administering vaccinations despite severe weather coming in. It was a super chilly camp out as the facility lost power for a while and it was minus 30 outside. Another crew were out in the community administering vaccinations at home for folks with health and mobility issues that made attending the clinics kind of challenging when they were attacked by wild dogs. This didn't deter them though, and they were back out again the next day. For many, ORI provided an opportunity to meet new people develop new friendships and form new partnerships with everyone that was involved. So what makes a CCP in Ontario a bit different? We must be ready for everything. Steam calls, small remote community emerge or quaternary care ICU transfers. Neonates, peds, adults, obstetrics, you name it, we move it. 40 degree weather to minus 40 degree weather. We maintain the highest level of care for patients of all ages and all conditions in some of the most austere environments. And we do it with a smile. Natalie, I think the uh, minus 30 degree puts the British minus seven last week, uh, you know, to shame really. Here's me thinking I was cold last week and I had a bit of a shiver and think about a campanile. I was laughing because uh, James Yates sent me a photo once of his uh, very reliable Subaru uh, handling the snow in the UK a couple of years back. And you could still see the little tops of the grass um, poking through the snow. So I, I sent him a photo back of my Subaru and I said, I, I swear it's there. It's just behind the snow drift. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. A uh, question that's come through with the, the such the long transfers that, that you encounter. What what so is there a portion of the workload that's on uh, palliation of patients? Not yet, but coming. So it's actually uh, just started. A couple of opportunities in the south that have come up, uh, but they're we're looking at trying to partner to be able to allow access to palliative care resources in a lot of the more remote communities especially with the medical um, assistance in death program uh, that's generally available only in our urban centers to be able to expand the availability of that service into remote communities uh, to service patient needs is something that uh, that's on the minds of a lot of us in our program and is something that we're in the process of working on. Brilliant. Listen, Natalie, I want to thank you again for your time. Those pictures are absolutely stunning. Thank you ever so much for your time, Natalie, and you take care. Thank you for having me. So we continue our journey in Canada.